What's up, Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another audiobook reading. So, today we are doing the second story in Somnophobia, which of course is Pressure. And oh my gosh, this... <laughs> this is a story and a half, okay? This one, I I love. I love. I think it's I think it's going to be overrated when it when it's like fully out and everyone has read it. But um honestly, it it's going to be overrated and good, I think. I think that's going to be the general like perception of this story. I I think this is this is a a very good story. So, let's let's get straight into this. Uh just one thing to note or I'll, just the usual thing is like, yes, I'm going to be um I'm going to be reading through this commenting on a few things here and there. Uh, I, I'm glad if you like that co kind of content. If you don't, then I'm sorry if this isn't for you. But um, And the other thing is, like, I'm not going to have the words on the screen like I used to. Uh, but the thing is, the trick is, if you wanted the words on your screen, you could buy the Kindle edition of the book, which costs less, and you can have it anywhere. You can have it on your phone, you can have it on your laptop or on your computer. Uh, and you can read along with me, or you can just get the normal book, but uh, yeah. Anyway, let's get into story two, Pressure. Luca jolted and stutter-stepped forward. He threw out a hand to brace himself from the shove against the nearest wall. He ground his teeth and turned to glare at his friend. Cut it out, Nolan! Nolan laughed and jumped on Luca, wrapping Luca in a playful headlock and dragging him to the red-carpeted floor. Luca easily flipped Nolan off and bounced back to his feet. What's up with you today, dude? Luca asked the muscular, shaggy blonde, who kept trying to roughhouse with Luca like they were little kids instead of high school seniors. You drink too much coffee this morning? No such thing. Nolan grinned up at Luca and extended a hand. Luca shook his head and took the hand. He pulled Nolan upright. Nolan grinned even wider and pulled Luca into a half hug. Luca gave in to the hug. But he wanted to shove the big oaf away. Friend was a word he wasn't sure applied to Nolan anymore. Yeah, he and Nolan and Asher had been hanging out together for a long time. But lately Luca wasn't sure why he spent time with his two so-called buddies. Well, actually, Asher wasn't the problem. It was Nolan. Ever since Nolan had started dating Maddie, he'd been acting like they were a royal couple. Which wasn't so hard when Maddie, uh, Luca's longtime friend, had been crowned homecoming queen this year. Now Luca felt increasingly like he and Asher were the king and queen subjects, and he, sh and he didn't like that feeling. Should I be jealous? Maddie asked, possessively putting her arm against Nolan's waist. She winked at Luca and wiggled her eyebrows at him. He sighed and turned away when Nolan leaned down and kissed his dark-haired and distractingly pretty girlfriend. Luca tried to ignore the pressure in his chest. Ooh, pressure. <laughs> Maddie's jealousy was pretend. Luca's wasn't. Luca had been in love with Maddie long before Nolan had made his move on her, and Nolan hadn't known how Luca felt. You snooze, you lose, Nolan had said when Luca had suggested that asking out the girl your friend was crazy about wasn't particularly cool. Come on, you guys, Asher said. Stop messing around. Check out all these costumes. Let's pick a scenario so we can decide who we want to be. Luca pulled his gaze away from the still smooching couple. He turned to Asher, who stood with his arms crossed. He was tapping his foot in dramatic impatience. Luca suppressed a smile. Asher, six feet two inches tall and wiry, had gotten into theatre at the start of the senior year. With thick brown hair and deep brown eyes, Asher was good looking enough to be a leading man, and he immediately landed choice roles when he auditioned. He'd gotten so into theatre that he'd announced he no longer wanted to go to law school and follow in his attorney father's footsteps. This had previously been his goal for as long as Luca had known him. When they'd been little, Asher had always wanted to play courtroom. Maddie, of course, had always been the judge. Asher was the defence attorney because that's what his dad was, and Luca played the opposing lawyer. They argued negligence cases. Asher might not have known what that word meant, but he loved it because his dad used it all the time. Luca could still remember some of the trials. The case of the spilled grape juice, the case of the overturned wagon resulting in a skinned knee, and the case of the stolen toy train. Luca had always lost these cases. Maddie thought Asher would win, or should win, sorry, because Asher was the one who wanted to be a lawyer and Luca was just playing along to be nice. 
but Asher didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. I'm going to be an actor, Asher had proclaimed the, leak the week before. Nolan had laughed at Asher's ambition. You and everyone else who gets a part in a school play, Nolan had teased. Luca hadn't made fun of Asher's grand goal. Luca's own ambitions were pretty lofty too. He already had received an athletic scholarship to a good university. He planned to play ball for four years and study phys ed. He was going to do well in college and then pursue a master's degree in sports science. Then he was going to work his way into a university football coaching position. Ultimately, he wanted to coach in the NFL. Luca was a good wide receiver. He was fast and agile. He wasn't, however, big or strong. He was 5 feet 10 inches tall and lanky. <laughs> I know how it feels. <laughs> he knew that sometimes guys his size made it in the pros. But Luca wasn't aggressive enough or confident enough to be one of them. He did, however, think he had the smarts to coach at that level. Because he figured every dream should have support behind it, Luca wanted to encourage Ash's new aspiration. Go for it, Ash, he told his friend. The only problem with Ash's new passion was that his theatrics had started bleeding into the rest of his life. Luca had noticed Ash's gestures and facial expressions were becoming more and more exaggerated. Now, for example, Asher rolled his eyes at the oblivious, still-kissing Nolan and Maddie, then looked to the ceiling, as if seeking divine intervention to part the two lovebirds. He sighed loudly and wandered away. Luca remained where he was, but he ignored the couple. He turned to eye several rows of animal costume suits and plain clothes costumes. He had to admit he was impressed by all the choices. When Nolan had shoved Luca, they'd just entered the costume closet, their first stop in the Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex roleplay venue, Urban Legend Roleplayers Auditorium. The huge room, which looked like an obsessive, crazy rich person's mega closet, was filled with hanging rods and shelves and cubby holes. All these were stuffed with animal suits and heads, clothes, shoes and other accessories. Everything was neatly organised and colour-coded. According to Asher, who had read up on the game before they had arrived to play it, the colour codes were associated with the various roleplay scenarios offered in the auditorium. Once you choose what story you wanted to play out, you picked the costumes accordingly. And here we go. Here is the part. Ah, uh, <laughs> this is... This is the part that everybody is going to go crazy at, even though it's only such, like, a tiny detail. Um, Inky Ink, I know you're listening to me. Uh, get excited. I am. Alright, listen to this. As Luca looked around, several kids and teens darted through the rows of costumes. They chattered excitedly as they examined their choices. <clears throat> Luca spotted a few of his classmates checking out a Golden Freddy costume and he smiled at a group of little girls arguing over who was going to wear a Chica costume. What? <laughs> I, I cannot believe this. Golden Freddy got a mention in a story? Excuse me? Um, so I'm sorry to kind of stop here. But this is very important because, first of all, this completely disproves Matt Pat's theory that, you know, Golden Freddy didn't exist and the first set of games were, like, non-existent. They, they weren't canon, essentially. So that kind of puts that into more perspective. But just in general, a Golden Freddy reference in one of these stories, that is insane. I love that. And I love how it's in the, the roleplay auditorium as well as, like, an urban legend. It's really, really cool. Anyway... Chica, the yellow chick holding an animated cupcake, appeared to be all three girls' favourite Freddy character. Beyond the go uh, girls, a Walter mirror, uh, sorry, a Walter wall mirror reflected the costumes and the excited soon-to-be role players. Luca caught a glimpse of himself and his friends in the glass. He cringed. Not for the first time, he noticed the contrast between them. Luca felt like he was the smallest of all the guys he knew. He might be a football player, but he didn't have the ripped muscles his friends had. He was also behind them in the facial hair department. Nolan and Asher, and most of the guys on the team, had been shaving for a while. Luca barely had enough fuzz on his chin to wave a razor at every week or so. On top of all that, thanks to Luca's perpetually t uh, tousled auburn hair, 
He had a cowlick that made neat styles impossible. He thought he looked more like a 13-year-old than a soon-to-be college freshman. And once football season was over, he no longer had helmet hair as an excuse. Luca shifted his attention back to the costumes. He eyed a security guard uniform. Even though security guards didn't generally fare well in Fazbear Entertainment games, Luca wanted to be a guard. He liked the idea of being the hero. Luca and his friends had been talking about trying out the roleplay auditorium ever since the Pizzaplex had opened. The VR venue in the Pizzaplex was great. The uh, the being uh, sorry, but being on a real set sounded like way more fun. Luca was a fan of horror movies and thought getting to act in a scary story would be a blast. His group of friends, especially their burgeoning star, Asher, agreed. Between classes and football practice, today's venture had been hard to schedule. So Luca was just as eager to get Ash, uh, just as eager as Asher to get started, even if he had to put up with the Nolan and Maddie show. The urban legend role players auditorium was set up for reenacting many of the rumors and ghost stories that had become associated with the Fazbear Entertainment brand over the years. It's so funny. I love this so much. It's such a creative way to go with the series. Luca thought the auditorium was a great marketing ploy. He was pretty sure the stories were more fact than myth or rumour. He'd read about the kids who disappeared, and he had no problem imagining their corpses stuffed away in the old Freddy's location, their ghosts finding a way to haunt the animatronics that were supposedly still in the abandoned restaurant. If Fazbear Entertainment couldn't shake the rumours, why not lean into them and make some money off of the believers? Believers like him, he had to admit. Asher waved to get Luca's attention. He pointed at a menu board of stories on a wall near the closet's entrance. Look at this one, Asher said. It's called Green Eared Killer. It's about three teens who break into the Fazbear Fright's haunted house and are stalked by Springtrap. They have to try and get away before he kills them. That sounds way cool. Maddie and Nolan finally came up for air. Maddie sauntered over to join Asher. The menu board looked like a scoreboard with a list of the available roleplay games. A slate square was next to each game name. A blank square meant the game was open for players. When you picked a game, you, initi uh, you initialed the square to indicate the game had been taken. I thought you were going to act out the actual haunting, Luca said. You wanted to act out the haunting, Maddie said. That's because you're obsessed with murderous animatronics. She flipped her long, wavy black hair over one bare shoulder. And murderous animatronics are just stupid. Luca forced himself to ignore the way the way Maddie's attention, good or bad, made him feel. She's taken, he told himself for the thousandth time. By your friend. Get over it. They aren't stupid. Where do you think Fazbear Entertainment got the ideas for all their games? You think they just plucked the notion of dangerous animatronics out of the clear blue sky? You think it's a coincidence that nearly all their game scenarios have to do with security guards or trespassers trying to be avoid being killed? Look at that! Luca pointed at the menu board. Most of the stories have to do with trying to survive a night in a security office, or trying to stay alive while patrolling the old restaurant, or trying to keep a music box going so the ghost doesn't haunt you. Luca felt himself getting worked up. He was sick of having to defend his interests. It's genius, actually. Fazbear Entertainment is trying to make light of all the stories. And why is that? Because there's truth to them. They keep coming up with games that have you crawling through vents and slamming through doors and hiding inside costumes because they know that their animatronics got out of control and killed people. It's all true. <laughs> I love how he, how he just like perfectly, perfectly got the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's right there. Nolan stared at Luca with raised eyebrows. <laughs> Dude, you sound like Grayson from Algebra. If you say the word cabal or you pu pull a tinfoil hat out of your pocket, I might puke. Luca rolled his eyes. Grayson was a geek who talked way too much in class and was always going on about evil corporate conspiracies and extraterrestrial mind control. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm just saying that creating games to make light of a bad reputation is a great, uh, it's a great way to downplay the lies. Luca made air quotes, being told about the company. Much ado about nothing, Asher said. Exactly, Luca nodded. Yeah, well, whatever, Maddie said. I want to be a damsel in distress. Let's play green-eared killer. I'll be one of the teens. She walked up and put her initials in the chalk next to the game on the menu board. 
The costume code is dark green. She linked a hand around Nolan's arm. Come on, stud boy. Let's go pick our costumes. Nolan grinned at the nickname Maddie had, st had recently started using for him. He affected a cocky swagger as the couple headed down a row of costumes. Asher and Luca exchanged a going-to-gag look and followed Maddie and Nolan obediently. But Luca wasn't happy about it. Luca had known Asher and Maddie for most of his life. They lived in the same neighbourhood. They'd played together as kids and hung out together in grade school and middle school. During that time, Luca had never thought of Maddie as anything but a friend. Always scruffy with wild hair and buck teeth. Maddie had been a tomboy, and she was just a pal, nothing more. When they'd gotten to high school though, Maddie, who was strong and athletic, had decided to try out for cheerleading. She wasn't as conventionally pretty as the other girls then, but her gymnastic ability landed her a spot on the squad. Soon after that, she got braces and the buck teeth turned into a perfect smile. She tamed her hair and started using makeup, and the tomboy vibes disappeared, replaced by a gorgeous teenager. In no time, Maddie was the head cheerleader, and this year, she'd become the homecoming queen and class president. And Luca was in love. He just never bothered to tell Maddie. Nolan had transformed, uh, sorry, Nolan had transferred into their school toward the end of the sophomore year, and he joined the junior varsity football team. Asher was the team's quarterback, and Luca was, in, was its star wide receiver. Nolan was on defense. Usually he was the cornerback. One day after tackling Luca in practice, he'd made a reference to a horror movie Luca liked. After practice, they'd met up with Asher and started talking movies. That was the start of him being part of the group. Recently, Luca had realised that though he and Asher still shared interests besides movie and football, wrestling and baseball and tennis and golf and fishing and camping, scary movies and football were about the only things Nolan had in common with either of them. Nolan a cut-up who never took life seriously, had always been cocky, but he seemed to be growing more arrogant every day. Luca was getting tired of it. And then there was the whole, you stole my soulmate thing. Luca was convinced that Maddie was the love of his life. He'd just been too dense to know it before she turned into a beauty queen. Here they are, Maddie said now. She waved a hand toward a row of costumes tagged with green plastic discs. Asher rushed forward and grabbed a pair of khaki pants and short-sleeved button-down shirt with a plastic pocket pen holder. I'll be the nerdy kid, he announced. I'll have to work hard to embody the role, but I can do it, Luca snorted. Maddie pulled out a short, cotton, floral dress. The dress's fabric was yellow and pink. Its hem was frilly. Oh, this is a perfect, distressed damsel dress. She held it up in front of her. The dress was too girly to suit Luca's taste. However, he was sure Maddie would look good in it, but Maddie would look good in a paper bag. Nolan reached out and snagged a pair of faded jeans and a black t-shirt. I'll be the cool dude, he said. Luca pulled his gaze from Maddie. He raised an eyebrow at the clothes Nolan held. How are those any different from what you normally wear? He looked pointedly at Nolan's jeans and dark grey shirt. Nolan looked down. In mock indignation, he said, These jeans aren't that faded, he grinned at Luca. Besides, if there's any fake blood involved in all this, I don't want to ruin my favourite duds. Luca shook his head. He scanned the row of costumes, then turned to the other side of the row and reached for a security guard costume. You can't wear that, Maddie said. She stepped up beside him and put a hand on his arm. Her fingers were warm on his skin. He quickly jerked his arm back. Why not? Maddie pointed at the red disc. That's not for the green-eared killer scenario. Yeah, Asher said. Besides, we need a killer. If we're all teens, he motioned to the clothes he and the others had picked out. You have to be Springtrap. The killer? Luca shook his head. No way, I'm not going to be the killer. Luca's friends lined up together and looked at him. You got no choice, dude, Nolan said. Yeah, Asher agreed. The scenario is called green-eared killer. There has to be a green-eared killer. That's Springtrap. It's the only choice left. So that's you. Luca shook his head harder. That's not me. And if that's the only choice, we're going to play a different game. Says who? Nolan asked. You're not the boss here. And you are? Luca shot back at Nolan. Nolan puffed up his already massive chest. He closed the distance between him and Luca. Maddie squeezed between them. Cut it out, you two. 
You're not going to have a fight over a role-playing game. She gave them both scathing looks. And besides, everyone knows I'm the boss here. Luca actually couldn't argue with that, but he could work with it. He stepped back, blocking his own grey eyes. A girl had once called them the Platinum Magic. He hadn't asked her for a second date. On Maddie's deep green ones, he said, Let's play a different game, Mads. Maddie twisted the corner of her mouth. Then she smiled at him. She turned to Asher. Want to take mercy on him and play something else? Asher shook his head. Flicking a glance at Luca, he said, Sorry, Luca. We already officially picked it. And besides, he turned and looked at the menu board. The other games have been taken. Luca followed Asher's gaze. Asher was right. In the few minutes he and his friends had been looking at the costumes, the empty squares next to all the other games had been filled in. Luca turned to Nolan. You be Springtrap. Nolan raised an eyebrow. Why me? Do I look like a killer? Asher made a show of looking Nolan up and down. Actually, with that crazy hair, yeah, you kind of do. You've got killer looks, Maddie told Nolan. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. That's great writing. Um, she squeezed his prominent bicep. <clears throat> Luca had to look away and press his lips together. <laughs> he didn't trust himself to speak. Nolan leaned toward the row of costumes. He plucked a ratty-looking puke yellow-green rabbit suit off the rack. Holding it out in front of him, he wrinkled his nose. Wow, this thing is realistic. It's not only gross-looking, it stinks. He thrusted it towards... Luca. Luca backed away. I am not wearing that thing. You are, and... Yeah, sorry. You are, if we're going to play the game, Asher said. Luca looked at Asher. Why don't you be Springtrap? Asher affected an I'm as cute as a bunny look. I'm way too good to be stuck inside a rabbit suit. Luca snorted. Asher grinned, and then he shrugged. Seriously, I picked my costume first. You could have picked, but you didn't. Luca told Asher... Sorry, Luca thought Asher sounded like a five-year-old, but he didn't say so. He looked back at Nolan. What's your excuse? You're a sick dude. You usually root for the killers in horror movies. Why not play one? Nolan grinned. I don't want to have to kill my girlfriend. Luca snorted. It's a role play. You think even role play stalking my girl is going to get me any more kisses today? Nolan asked, winking at Maddie. Maddie bumped shoulders with Nolan. She returned his wink. Then she bunched up her brows and hugged herself. It would kind of weird me out to kiss a guy who'd killed me, even if it was pretend. And you think I want to kill you? Luca asked. You did when I stole your bike in second grade and crashed into Mr. Weinberg's rose arbor, Maddie grinned. Remember how pissed he was? Wow, that was, I didn't realise I was going to be swearing in this. Anyway, for a second, Luca forgot about the springtrap suit and smiled at the memory of Maddie using his stolen bike to try to catapult over their neighbour's big cement shrub fountain. She'd clipped the cherub's wing and ended up launching herself into the arbour. On impact, she'd bent the wheels of Luca's bike and made a mess of Mr. Weinberg's prized climbing roses. Luca crossed his arms. I remember how pissed I was. Exactly my point, Maddie said. Channel that feeling. She grabbed the suit and held it out to Luca. Put on the frickin' suit. Luca winced as he stared at the suit's matted greenish fur. The costume really was an abomination. Luca knew it was supposed to be a rabbit suit, but it wasn't representative of any rabbit you'd want to pick up and cuddle. Like all the Fazbear Entertainment animal characters, this rabbit was a caricature of an ordinary rabbit, like a rabbit created in, in, a, in an evil scientist's lab. With torn ears and patches of yellow-green fur ripped away, the suit's substructure was exposed in several places. It looked old and rusty. Or was that rust? The reddish splotches could have been something else. After all, the Springtrap suit had been worn by a killer. At least, that was the story. You afraid you're gonna get... Uh, God, I'm so bad at reading. You afraid you're gonna get cooties? Nolan mocked in a sing-song voice. Luca didn't bother responding. Cooties weren't his problem. Oh, what, what are cooties? I don't know what cooties are. No, he didn't relish the idea of getting inside the stinky, rotten-looking costume. The idea of putting its metal lining against his skin gave him the willies. He could almost feel himself regressing from 17 years old to 7. That, however, wasn't why he abhorred the idea of putting on a suit. His problem with being Springtrap didn't lie with a costume. His problem was with who Springtrap was.
according to Faz Bear Law, yes, this is this is the thing, guys. Faz Bear Law. <laughs> according to Faz Bear Law, Springtrap was the alter ego, the evil persona of William Afton. We got a freaking William Afton name drop. What? The man who had kidnapped and killed little kids at a Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria. The real Afton had apparently gone and trapped in a, uh, in a rabbit suit and had eventually died. Sort of. Inside of it. In the most nightmarish rumours associated with Freddy's, Afton's corpse had come back to life somehow. And in doing so, he turned into Springtrap. Fazbear Entertainment made light of this fable, as they called it. This was why they'd made the character part of the game. As Luca gazed at the suit, at the suit now, he was pretty sure he was right in thinking that the fables weren't exactly fables. He had no trouble imagining the suit animated by a real killer. Maddie lost her patience and shoved the springtrap suit against Luca's chest. Take it, she commanded. She pointed to the end of the row of costumes where a neon dressing room sign glowed red above a small arched doorway. Go put it on. Without understanding why, Luca grasped the suit when Maddie let go of it, but he almost immediately dropped it. The suit's fur felt crusty. It was scummy too, like it was covered with some kind of invisible slime. Luca managed to hang on to the suit, but that didn't mean he was going to put it on. He looked at his friends. Why don't we all play teens and we'll just pretend Springtrap is after us? Oh, give me a break, Asher heaved a big sigh. What would be the point of that? He stepped forward and poked Luca in the chest. I thought you wanted to do this. You were as into it as we were when we first talked about it. What's wrong with you? Luca frowned at Asher. Nothing's wrong with me. I just don't want to pretend to be a creepy murderer. That's all. I wanted to be the security guard. Luca cringed inwardly. He hoped his friends hadn't heard his whine in his voice. Now he was starting to sound like a seven-year-old. What? Is, is, is pretending to be a killer scary? Nolan asked. He emphasised the word scary in a tone that made it clear he thought Luca was being a coward. Yeah, Asher said. Is it too up close and personal for you? Luca made a face. I don't even know what that means. I just don't want to be the killer, okay? You guys are being jerks. They're not being jerks, Maddie growled. You are. You're acting like a baby. You need to get over yourself. Asher stepped up beside Maddie. She's right, Luca. You're being childish. It's just a roleplay game. And that, he, poked, he pointed at the suit, is just dirty fake fur and old metal. It's not going to hurt you, and neither is pretending to be a killer. It's just acting. Luca looked from Asher to Maddie to Nolan. They were standing almost shoulder to shoulder now, like a phalanx of, shoulder, of soldiers commanding him to step in line and follow orders. Why couldn't they understand how much he didn't want to do this? Why didn't they just... Why didn't they get just how wrong it was to pretend to be a murdering maniac? Well, that was the problem. They believed it was just pretend. They weren't thinking about what had really happened. They weren't thinking about the poor, terrified victims. Luca was thinking about the victims. Not long after Luca and his parents had moved into their neighbourhood, about a year before Asher and Maddie's families had moved in, a four-year-old down the street had disappeared. A little boy named Kenny. Luca's and Kenny's parents were professors at the nearby college, and they were all friends, so Luca had played with Kenny. Kenny had been like a little puppy, following Luca everywhere. Luca hadn't minded. He was an only child, and he liked playing big brother to Kenny. He taught Kenny all kinds of things. How to build a castle out of blocks, how to race cars off the porch rails, how to catch frogs down by the stream that ran behind their houses. When Kenny had disappeared, Luca hadn't understood what his parents and Kenny's parents had been talking about when they said he had been kidnapped. He couldn't figure out why Kenny couldn't just come back and play. When Kenny's body was found, in the same creek Luca and Kenny had played in, Luca's parents had tried to explain to him why bad people sometimes hurt good little kids. For months after Kenny had died, Luca had suffered from a reoccurring nightmare. Every night, he would hear Kenny scream and cry, and he tried to get Kenny to save him. Every night, He'd get there too late and he'd watch Kenny die. He still sometimes had that horrible dream. Luca never talked about Kenny. His friends didn't know. Would they relent if he told them now? Nolan suddenly pushed Luca back against the shelving behind him. You know what you are, Luca? Nolan snarled. You're a coward. Nolan made as if to push Luca again. Luca backed away. 
but he locked eyes with his friend. Don't push me, Lucas said the words evenly and quietly, but apparently no one got the message. He backed off. Asher spoke up. There, see? Just do that and you'll make a great spring trap. Lucas shook his head. I'm not going to be spring trap, he said. Hard pass. We need to do something else. All three of Lucas' friends gave him scathing looks. Maddie put her hands on her hips. You're being silly, Luca. And you're being selfish. Come on. We all agree to do this. Wear the costume. Please. For me. Luca took a deep breath and blew it out. What was the point in trying to explain himself to his friends? They weren't going to get it. And if he told them about Kenny, well, they'd probably just make fun of him for having nightmares. For caring so much. Luca looked at the suit, which he still held. He glanced toward the door leading out of the roleplay auditorium. Beyond the door, the bright lights and happy music and laughter in the rest of the pizza plex reached into the room. He could almost feel them crawl to him, encouraging him not to give in. He could just leave, couldn't he? Yeah, and, and have it get around the school that the team's star-wide receiver had a tantrum over some dumb game. They were only halfway through the year. The ribbing he'd get wouldn't be pretty. Luca looked at Maddie. She gave him her sweetest smile. Luca sighed. Fine, I'll wear the suit. Maddie threw up her hands. Well, that was like exhausting. You'd have thought we were asking you to kill the Pope or something. <laughs> that was very casual. Just a strange line right there. Asher shook his head at Luca. Drama much? Nolan gave Luca a hard look. Then he pointed at the dressing rooms. Go put it on before you chicken out again. <laughs> in the dressing room area, Lucas stepped into a cubicle, dragging the rabbit suit behind him like a carcass. He pulled across behind him the small red curtain that draped over the cubicle's opening. The rabbit suit hung from a wooden hanger, which Luca hooked over a short brass rod extending from the yellow wall. He immediately wiped his hands on the jeans, uh, as if he could rub away the stink of everything the suit stood for. Lucas stared at the decrepit rabbit costume. Was he really going to do this? Luca could hear Nolan and Asher bantering in the next couple cubicles as they put on their costumes. <laughs> yeah, right, Luca muttered. Costumes. All they had to do was put on different street clothes. We hear you grousing in there, Nolan called out. You'd better be putting that suit on. If you're not, I'll come in and do it myself. You and what army? Luca shot back. Nolan and Asher laughed. Yeah, yuck it up, jerks, Luca thought. They weren't the ones having to put on an evil costume. Luca looked at the suit again, exhaling loudly. He reached for it. Wearing the Springtrap suit as opposed to the other costumes did have one advantage. Whereas Asher, Nolan and Maddie had to shed their clothes and put them in a locker before they got dressed for the game, Luca could put the suit on over his clothes, even over his shoes. Big and baggy. The suit looked like it could fit a guy bigger than Asher. Um, the disgusting rabbit suit came in two pieces. One piece was the big, ghoul-eyed, toothy-mouthed, broken-eared head. The other piece was the rest of the rabbit's body. This part of the suit was kind of like a hideous onesie for demented adults. The onesie had gotten closures up the front, so it wasn't hard to get on. All Luca had to do was step on it. Or step into it, sorry. <laughs> Once Luca shoved his tennis shoe clad feet inside the oversized rabbit feet and started to pull the suit upward, he discovered it was designed to expand and contract. Both the fur and metal skeleton beneath the fur stretched to accommodate his height as he brought it up his legs. When he got the suit to his waist, he only had to contort a little to shrug one and then the other shoulder into the rabbit's torso. His stomach roiling with reluctance and dread, Luca closed up the suit. He looked at himself in the mirror. From the neck down, Luca was no longer Luca. He was a mouldering rabbit that looked like an escapee from an apocalyptic trash heap. From the neck up, Luca still looked like Luca, sort of. Actually, he wasn't quite himself. His skin next to the putrid green fur looked sallow, and his forehead was, was glistening with sweat. His eyes looked strange and dark circles had appeared under them. Or was that just the dressing room's dim lighting? Behind Luca, a curtain swished open. He whirled around. Hey, Luca objected. Asher and Nolan ignored his protests. They crowded in next to Luca and stared at him. Sweet, Nolan said. Put the head on. I want to see the whole enchilada. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> That's such a weird sentence. Asher brushed against the torn rabbit fur. He quickly recoiled. You see, Luca said. Asher gave Luca a sheepish smile. I mean, yay, you look great. Stuff it, Luca said. Just put the head on, Nolan repeated. Luca felt like an automaton when he lifted his head and pulled it down over his own. When he inhaled, he nearly retched. It smells like dead fish. His voice sounded funny from inside the rabbit head, a little muffled and mushy. His vision wasn't quite right either. He could see, but looking out through the milky white eyes of the rabbit head gave everything a filmy appearance, as if it was all swathed in gauze. Luca didn't like this. He didn't like it at all. Luca started to reach up and take the head off. He changed his mind. He couldn't do this. Before Luca got a grip on the rabbit head, Nolan lifted his hands and tugged the head more firmly into place. He reached around the behind the head and snapped something together. There, he said. You all set. Luca frowned and used his skeletal looking rabbit hands to try to lift off the rabbit head. The head didn't budge. There's a release mechanism in the back, Asher said, craning his neck to examine the suit. But leave it alone. You look great. Yeah, Nolan agreed. Let's do this. Luca rotated to look at himself in the mirror again. He couldn't help himself. He had to see the full effect. As soon as he saw it, he wished he hadn't. He'd gone from being what he always thought was reasonably okay, looking to being totally repulsive. Now that Luca had the rabbit head on, he could see just how vile it was. With exposed yellowish teeth, the rabbit's mouth was a grim maw of desolation. Or desolation, sorry. A wire stuck out from the rabbit's jaw, and one of the holes in the fur on the rabbit's head exposed more protruding wires. Even more wires extended from beneath the rabbit's dark eye sockets. Luca lifted his hands and once again tried to pull off the rabbit's head. He shifted his attention to the rabbit's paws. Not so much paws as big fuzzy hands. The coverings over Luca's own hands were missing a lot of fur. Several of the fingers were exposed metal. Luca's knuckles, beneath that metal, felt entrapped and chafed. Stop that, Asher said. You're not getting out of this. Nolan and Asher grabbed Luca, aka Springtrap, by the arms and dragged him out of the dressing room. Luca didn't resist. I might as well get it over with, he thought. He'd agree to it. He'd look like even more of a loser if he backed out now. Outside the dressing room, a neon sign pointed to a hallway that had multiple doors. Each door had another neon sign above it. The signs labelled the sets for each game. Luca, Asher and Nolan paused at the end of the hallway to wait for Maddie. Asher and Nolan started talking smack about how they were going to win the game. Luca ignored them. His attention had been caught by the little girls he'd watched earlier. The little girls were now playing around outside a game door a few feet away. One of the girls was giggling, adjusting her Chica costume head. The other girl was laughing hysterically because her Freddy head kept falling off. The third girl, dressed as Foxy, the fox character with the eye patch and the metal hook, was lunging this way and that, waving her plastic hook around. She was oblivious to her friends. She was also oblivious of the Fazbear employee who leaned against the back, the, the back wall of the costume closet. The employee, a lanky 30-something guy with a super short haircut and large ears, was watching the little girls. The fact that the employee, whose name tag read Earl, was watching the little girls wasn't in an and of itself bad. After all, Luca was watching the little girls too. The difference between Luca's observations and Earl's staring was that Luca's attention on the girls was benign. He thought the girls' antics were cute. Judging from the expression on Earl's long, narrow face, Earl didn't see cute. His pale blue eyes squinted just slightly and his mouth stretched into a salacious leer. Earl's interest in the girls was not benign at all. Earl was looking at the girls like they were tasty morsels. His focus was so, well, icky, that Luca took a step forward, intending to confront the guy. Before Luca could take a second step, two little boys raced into the costume closet. Screaming in excitement, their feet pounded across the floor. Earl shifted his attention to the boys, but his expression didn't change. Luca hesitated, wondering if confrontation was the right move. Sure, he could easily handle the guy, but the guy would play dumb, and Luca would look like the aggressor. Luca started scanning the costume closet, trying to find another employee. Maybe he could report what he'd seen. 
He didn't find any other employees, but he did spot Maddie. Are you guys ready? Maddie called out as she skipped toward Luca and his friends. Um, Luca turned to Maddie. As predicted, Maddie looked amazing in the floral dress. For a second, Luca forgot about Earl. When he remembered, he rotated back to where Earl was lurking. Earl was gone. Luca spun in a full circle, searching the area for the skinny guy in the red Fazbear employee shirt. He didn't see Earl anywhere. Are you coming? Maddie tugged on the arm of Luca's rabbit suit. Luca looked one last time for the unsettling employee. He hesitated. Should he try to find a manager? Maddie tugged again. Um, you're not getting out of this. Come on. Luca let Maddie drag him down the hall to where Asher and Nolan were already opening the door to the greener-eared killer set. Asher grinned. Let's do this. He and Nolan disappeared through the door. Maddie pulled Luca across the threshold behind them. Each designated area in the roleplay auditorium was a tableau designed to fit a specific game. The green-eared killer staging area was a replica of the original Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, which also included elements of the Fazbear's Fright Haunted House. From what Luca had read about the Urban Legend roleplayers auditorium before they'd gotten here, all the staging areas were hybrids of multiple locations. Each area was a combined venue packed full of themes from the old stories. Luca had never been to either the original Freddy's or the Fazbear Haunted House, but he'd played the games. He had an idea of what why uh, he had an idea of what the pizzeria should look like, and this game set was exactly right. He was blown away by its authenticity. <laughs> oh my god, I I absolutely butchered that word, authenticity. The entrance to the roleplay area. Listen to this. This is very interesting. I've got a detail to point out. The entrance to the roleplay arena was a crumbling bridge archway. Uh, did I say... Oh my god, I said that completely wrong. It was a crumbling brick archway. There we go. Since the pizzaplex was relatively new, the archway Luca was looking at couldn't have even been a year old, but it looked like a long-forgotten entrance to a place better left not remembered. Here's the thing about this archway, guys. Here's the thing. That is That was not in any of the games, right? That, that that kind of archway, that wasn't in any of the games, uh, especially for FNAF 3, I would say. It wasn't. The thing it was in, like, that, there was actually something that this archway was in. It was in freaking What We Found. <laughs> the, the story What We Found. Can you believe that? Can you believe that's where that kind of archway was? It was the arch, like, the entrance to um, Fazbear's Fright in that story had an archway like the one that was described. So um, I don't know what that really means for the continuity of what we found, but I, it probably isn't anything. It's probably just like a, a thing they put in as either unintentional detail or Easter egg, but probably nothing more. Anyway, that's a cool little detail that I kind of wanted to point out. Anyway, Luca was looking like, uh, Luca was looking at, wait, Never mind, I completely butchered that. Since the Peterplex was relatively new, the archway Luca was looking at couldn't have been even a year old, but it looked like a long forgotten entrance to a place better left not remembered. Maddie grabbed Nolan's hand and pulled him through the archway. Look at this, she gushed. It's totally dope. Luca and Asher trailed behind Maddie and Nolan. Their feet made tapping and scuffling sounds on the black and white checkered linoleum floor. Luca couldn't see the whole place from where they stood, but he figured there would be a dining area with a stage, a backstage area, an arcade, a pirate's cove, kitchens, an office, a back hallway, storage rooms, party rooms, and a network of large ventilation ducts running through all of it. All these rooms, at least in the games he'd played, were designed to look old and eerie. They were dimly lit, packed with disturbing Fazbear decor, and populated by knockoffs of the original animatronics. The actual haunted house and the games based on the house would cho um were chock full of jump scares. Luca assumed this set would include them as well, although in the game they were playing, Springtrap, i.e. Luca, was the real jump scare. So how does this work? Maddie asked. Asher turned in a circle. He spotted a sign next to the archway, and he stepped over to read it. Luca didn't follow him. He was still trying to convince himself he was actually in a disgusting rabbit suit, getting ready to chase his friends around a pretend haunted house. Why had this seemed like such a good idea when they planned it? 
Okay, Asher said. According to the instructions here, we, in, he indicated himself, Maddie and Nolan, we're supposed to go down that hallway, he pointed. There's a little room down there, looks like the backstage area of the game. Once we close the door, uh, the door basically becomes what we're going to get through to break into the haunted house. Even though we're breaking in after dark, the venue's attractions are going to somehow get activated. So it's going to be like a haunted house with a chaser. Springtrap's the chaser. Asher pointed at Luca and gave Luca a thumbs up. Luca didn't move. What's he supposed to do? Manny pointed at Luca. Asher glanced back at the instructions. Then he looked at Luca. You're supposed to go to the safe room. Oh my gosh, I forgot about this part. They mentioned the freaking safe room. They know about the safe room. Okay, obviously they know about the safe room because, you know, they took Springtrap out of it in the FNAF 1 location. But yeah, the freaking the safe room is here. It, it, this is amazing. I love, I love the details in the story. It's so, the world building is so good. It's a small room at the end of the back hall. You're supposed to go in, close the door, and then wait for the door to open again. Then you come and chase us. Apparently there's a knife, not a real one, of course, in there someplace. You're supposed to pretend to try to stab us or grab us or whatever. When Luca didn't respond, Asher said, Got it? Luca nodded. When he did, something rough rubbed at the back of his neck. He reached up to try to adjust the rabbit head. The rubbing stopped, but the skin on his neck felt scratched. Asher read aloud some more of the instructions. It was something about how long the game lasted and how you left the game. Luca was only half listening. The scratch on his neck distracted him. Asher studied the game's instructions for a few more seconds. He turned to Nolan and Maddie. There's some stuff here about ways he can handle Springtrap, or we can handle Springtrap. Luca turned toward the instructions. He might as well know the defense's strategy. Asher blocked his view. Nuh-uh, no fair. You don't need to know anything else. Well, we're on a timer, guys, Maddie said. Let's do this. Come on. She grabbed Nolan's hand and motioned for Asher to come with them. Asher turned Luca away from the game's instructions. Luca shrugged. What did he care anyway? He just wanted to get us over with. Asher lifted a fist and offered it to Luca. Good game, right? Asher said, just like he did before they took the field at their games. Luca raised his fist and bumped Asher's. Good game. Something poked the underside of Luca's right wrist. He unclenched his hand and dropped it to his side. He watched Asher trot after Maddie and Nolan. Luca looked around. He shrugged. He knew he'd find the back hallway off the rear of the dining area, so he headed in that direction. As he took his first step, a distant pop resounded through the set, and the lights dimmed. Shadows stretched out in front of him. Luca took a deep breath and a few steps. He winced. The Springtrap suit was not, at all, uh, was not at all comfortable. Although it had expanded to fit him, it now felt like it was tightening around his body. The metal framework was poking him in a my myriad, myriad, sorry, myriad of places. He felt like he was wearing a broken cage. Mmm. Luca tried to ignore the unpleasant sensation of metal prodding him through his shirt and jeans. He crossed the black and white tiled floor and headed down a short hall. Even though the haunted house was dark and gloomy, Luca could see well enough. He marvelled at just how chilling the place looked. The set, like the dilapidated archway, was relatively new. It felt, however, as if Luca was inside a building that had been ravaged by, uh, ravaged by time. Nothing about the place felt fake. The walls Luca passed as he moved further into the set looked dirty and mouldy and cobwebs stretched across murky corners and hung limply from barely flickering wool wool what is that word wool sconces Scon sconches yeah sconces the mottled walls were decorated with old freddy posters and decayed parts from fazbear characters the parts animatronic heads limbs hands and feet along with wires and gears were caught up in netting or dangling from filthy strings. Occasionally, they were pinned to the wall with incongruently gleaming knives. Luca idly wondered if the knives were as fake as the one he was supposed to use. Luca didn't linger near any of the walls. He walked as fast as he could in 
wait for my dinghy to load, the cumbersome and cramped suit, and finally reached the dining area. The dining area looked like it had been abandoned in the middle of a birthday party. Half-eaten pizzas and half-drunk sodas sat on red and white striped tablecloths next to bright yellow napkins. Freddy Fazbear birthday hats were strewn on the tables and the chairs. The chairs were askew. Curious, Luca reached out to touch a pizza as he passed a table. Even though he couldn't fully feel it through the suit's decayed-looking rabbit paws, he could tell it was made of rubber. Clever. From down the hall behind Luca, a crack and thump warned him that his friends were starting their break-in. He picked up his pace so he could get to the safe room before they reached him. At the far side of the dining area, a stage ran the length of the room. Its curtains were pulled back partly just far enough to reveal statues. At least Luca figured they were statues of Freddy's original animatronics. Freddy the bear with the top hat, Chica the chick wearing an apron and holding a plate with a toothy cupcake, and Bonnie, the purple guitar-playing bunny, clustered near centre stage. They were unmoving, but the way their gaze was aimed toward Luca made them look like they might start performing, or worse, any second. Luca turned away from the stage. He spotted the back hallway, but he was suddenly reluctant to go where he was assigned. Part of the reason he'd wanted to come was to explore, right? Defiant of his friends and the rules, he headed in the opposite direction, toward the arcade area. Unlike the arcade and the pizzaplex, which was filled with so many bright lights and emitted so many bleeps and dings and tinny music that the din was so overwhelming, this arcade was dark and quiet. All the games looked broken, and they were covered with a hefty layer of dust. Beyond the grimy, oh, sorry, the grimy, the grimy arcade, the purple and gold starred curtain to Fox to Pirates Cove was closed, but the hem of the re- velvet fabric fluttered. Lucas stared at the movement, but he shrugged it off. It wasn't like Foxy was actually back there. Muddy's high-pitched giggle echoed through the set, and Luca heard the low rumble of Nolan's voice. Asher said something in response to Nolan, and Maddie laughed again. Luca could hear his friend's footsteps in the main hall. They were getting closer pretty fast. Luca had to move. Luca headed toward the back hallway and trotted <laughs> into the inky tunnel. But once he was out of the dining room, Luca hesitated. He couldn't help himself. This was the infamous hallway, the one the killer used to take the kids to their deaths. Well, actually, it wasn't the hallway. This was a reproduction, obviously, but Luca could have sworn it was the real thing. Not only did it look like the narrow, dingy hallway of urban legend infamy, it felt like it could easily be the conduit to a very bad place. Behind Luca, his friend's footsteps reached the dining area. He started to stride down the hall. Then his steps faltered. He stopped and listened. Sibilant sighs wafted through the hallway. They carried with them the sounds of sobbing and childlike pleas. Luca frowned and shook his head. It was just an audio track, he reminded himself. This was a fake haunted house. A chair scraped across the floor in the distance. His friends had reached the dining room. Luca started trotting down the hall. As he jogged along, something inside the rabbit suit gouged Luca's forearm. He sucked in his breath. What was that? Muddy asked. She wasn't really close, but she was closer than Luca should have let her get. He should have been in the safe room a long time ago. Manny's question, however, although she didn't know it, was a good one. What was that gouge that Luca had just felt? He didn't have time to think about the question for long, because the next thing Maddie said was, Oh, look at the animatronics. Luca heard Maddie's leather flats tap across the bare floor. Her footsteps reached the base of the stage. This is so cool. Luca listened to Maddie trot up the stairs to the stage, just as he reached the doorway to the last room at the end of the hall. Although he could easily hear his friends from where he was, he knew they didn't hear him. They couldn't see... Um, They couldn't see him either. The hall was as dark as any subterranean passageway. As Luca ducked into the little room, he heard Nolan calling out, Be careful, babe. This place has surprises. Luca pulled the door closed. As soon as the door settled into place, it clicked. Luca reached out to try to open it. The handle wouldn't turn. The door was locked. Although being stuck in a locked room wasn't ideal, Luca wasn't too worried about it. He figured the game would unlock the door after a prescribed amount of time. He turned to look at his surroundings, but Luca couldn't see anything. 
the room was pitch black. Luca felt around for a light switch and he quickly realised that feeling anything was a challenge. Inside the suit, his hands, his hands couldn't sense much at all. The only thing he could do was sweep the paw up and down over the wall, hoping he might eventually encounter something. After a few seconds of groping, Luca was in complete darkness. Or, no, not complete. A barely there glow reached in around the door's frame. It wasn't much, but it was enough to ease the tension that had bunched up Luca's shoulders while he groped for a way to turn on the lights. Luca tried to see what was in the room. All he could make out was some squarish shapes that might not have been boxes. He tried not to wonder what was behind them. As his eyes further adjusted to the lack of light, Luca spotted something on the floor. He bent over to see what it was. Ah, it was the rubber knife. Or at least he hoped it was rubber. It looked pretty real. Luca picked up the knife. He closed his rabbit fist around the knife's hilt and touched the tip with the rabbit finger. It gave a little... Uh, sorry, it gave a little. Good. Rubber. <laughs> Luca straightened. As he did, the suit pinched him a little tighter around the waist. Something abrasive scraped against his tailbone. Should it be doing this? Could it be... No. He wouldn't let himself think like that. He was too wound up already. This was just a game. The door made a tiny humming sound. Then, with a suctioning wish, the door opened. Exhaling in relief, Luca grasped his fake knife and hurried out of the room. Luca quickly headed down the hall. He was ready to pretend to kill his friends so he could finish the game and get out of the rabbit suit. Once he was several feet from the little room, Luca slowed down. He could hear Maddie's voice in the dining room. She was talking about the animatronics. Luca padded down the hall. As he went, something poked against his ankle. He rotated his ankle, readjusting his foot position in the suit. Man, he couldn't wait to get out of this thing. Luca crept up to the doorway leading into the dining room. He peered past the threshold. His friends were near the stage. They were still looking at the animatronic statues. Luca figured now was a, uh, as good a time as, to, as any to get into his role. He lifted his rubber knife and he prepared to rush into the dining room. But then the stage lights suddenly burst on. Even more lights flooded the dining room. 80s rock music blared. A kaleidoscope on the ceiling began to spin, throwing fractals of coloured light everywhere. Although the lights and music in of themselves weren't scary, the sudden contrast from dim and quiet to bright and loud was disorienting. Manny ducked into Nolan's arms, and Asher, I was going to say Usher, and Asher staggered back into a table. In the harshly coloured lights, it was hard to tell, but it looked like Nolan might have gone pale. Good, served him right. Served them all right. Asher recovered first. Whoa, he breathed. Maddie looked around the room, and her initial fearful expression turned into glee. Wow, this is so awesome. She stepped away from Nolan and started dancing. Nolan and Asher laughed and watched her. Almost as fast as the lights and music had come on, they went off. The previously dim lights went off too. The entire room was now dark. As the blackness descended, maniacal laughter echoed through the room. The sound of pounding footsteps came from the stage. Maddie let out a little shriek. Asher gasped. The footsteps stopped. In the distance, a door slammed. Luca's heart was racing and he took a long, quiet breath. A few feet from him, his friends were breathing loudly. The haunted house's little series of surprises had gotten to all of them. Luca should make his move now. Luca took a second to remind himself of the dining area's layout and then he strode into the room. He stayed close to the stage, hoping to avoid running into any tables and chairs, and he rushed forward, aiming toward where he could hear Mad Maddie's nervous giggle. A chair scraped. Nolan swore. The dim lighting returned. Maddie glanced around and saw Luca, his knife raised. She screamed. Luca flinched at the sound of Maddie's screech. He reached for her. She screamed again. Luca actually hadn't intended to scare Maddie when he'd held out his hand. Her first scream had pulled him completely out of character. Not that he'd ever been in character to begin with. He'd been reaching to be sure she was okay. When she screamed the second time though, he realised she was screaming because of him. Maddie, he said. She turned and ran away from the stage, heading in the direction of Pirate's Cove. Luca involuntarily started after her. As he did, the purple and gold curtains swished open. Foxy stepped forward and swiped at Maddie with his hook. 
Muddy veered out of the way at the last minute. She screamed even louder. Foxy surprised Luca as much as he did Muddy. Luca jerked back when the fox's hook scythed the air a second time. When Luca jerked, something clamped around his thigh. Or clamped some... Sorry. Yeah. Muddy, he called out. Muddy shrieked and ran toward the opposite side of the dining room. Asher and Nolan joined her, and the three disappeared down a long hallway. Luca glanced at Foxy, and he realised that Foxy wasn't as real as he had appeared to be. The fox wasn't an animatronic. It was a statue manipulated by a relatively simple system of ropes and pulleys, almost like a three-dimensional pop-up book. It was obviously designed to go through a preset series of moves for a jump scare. Guys! Luca called out. They must have figured Luca was being Springtrap, but he wasn't. He put a hand to his leg and moaned. Whatever had grabbed his thigh hadn't let go. It felt like a metal trap had glommed onto his leg. It had broken his skin as well. He could feel warmth trickling down over his knee, and the moisture wasn't sweat. He was bleeding. He was sure of it. From somewhere down the hallway, Maddie, Nolan, and Asher had raced into a door slammed. Uh, oh, sorry, I read that completely wrong. They raced down the hallway and a door slammed. Um, loud metallic screeches reverberated into the room. Maddie and the guys tore back into the dining room, but when they spotted Luca limping, limping through the rows of tables, they bolted back toward the lobby. The lights flickered brighter for an instant, and then went completely dark again. The sounds of murmuring voices suddenly seemed to come from every wall. Luca wove his way through the dining area, heading for the front hallway. When he got there, grimacing at the throbbing pain in his leg, the hallway was empty. Where had his friends gone? They were probably hiding in one of the rooms that opened up along the lobby. Luca started down the hall. Luca trudged past walls hung with more Freddy's posters, which along here were interspersed with yellowing and curling children's drawings. They cracked, oh, sorry, they crackled as he passed them. I'm so bad at reading. Um, Luca pushed open the door to a storage room. It was stuffed with boxes. He stepped in and looked around. His friends weren't here. After checking out a janitorial closet and a restroom, both of which were empty, Luca continued on down the hall. When he got to the door leading into the park and service room, he heard wimp whispering. Sorry. His friends were hiding behind the door. Luca reached out, intending to push the door open. Before he could, the door swung back. Lo Nolan came charging out, bellowing at the top of his lungs and wielding an animatronic leg. Luca was barely able to step back in time to avoid getting bashed in the face with a metal leg. Hey! The attack surprised him. He was supposed to be the killer, wasn't he? Luca reacted without thinking and grabbed the end of the metal leg. He wrenched it from Nolan's grasp and Nolan stumbled back. Luca dropped the metal leg and lunged for Nolan. Nolan spun away from Luca. As he did, Maddie and Asher dashed into the hall. The three linked hands and tore away from Luca, heading toward the end of the hall. You can't hide from me. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, wait, I, I was going to I was going to do it in character. But the next line says he called out again. He wasn't being in character. He meant it literally. But I am going to do a spring trap voice because I think that's really funny. And, it, and maybe it will sound like that from the suit anyway. You can't hide from me. <laughs> oh, my God, that is not a spring trap voice. But I'm going with it. I'm going with it. I'm, I'm being comfortable. Uh, yeah, OK, I'm doing it. Um. You can't hide from me, he called out. Again, he wasn't being in character. He meant it literally. If his friends hid, what was the point of the game? Why had they bothered with all this dress-up and charades if he was going to stomp around and they were going to cower in some dark corner? Lucas strode down the hall after his friends. As he did, the rabbit suit shifted and something gouged him in the ribs. Luca gasped and grabbed his side. Up ahead, Maddie, Nolan and Asher ducked into a door on the right side of the hallway. Luca picked up his pace. He stopped, though, when static spurted from speakers overhead. A whirring sound burst forth, and then the tinkling sound of a little kid's laughter was followed by a child's voice calling out, Hello? <laughs> what the heck was that? Luca frowned at the speakers as they spit a couple seconds of static, and then went silent. I knew it! In one of the VR games, the security guard used the audio system to play characters' voices to distract Springtrap. I love how they refer to the VR games here. I love it. It's, it's amazing. It's so good. What Luca had just heard was one of Balloon Boy's lines. 
Luca had never liked the perky little animatronic boy holding the balloon sign. He couldn't believe he'd let himself react to the recording of the character's voice. Luca stepped through the doorway his friends had used, but they were long gone. Luca looked around. He was standing in a duplicate of an old Freddy security office. The small and dingy room had a scratched wood desk, a credenza, and a dented metal filing cabinet. Clunky monitors, dusty keyboards, and random piles of paper covered the furniture's surfaces. A crooked old black metal fan rotated lazily on the credenza. It creaked as it ran, and the breeze it created rustled the papers. The office had no windows Luca's friends could have used for an escape. The only other way out was through a vent. Luca bent over and looked under the credenza. Yep, a vent cover, swinging from one remaining screw, hung loosely away from the duct opening. Luca crouched down to think. He shouldn't have done that. When Luca bent his knees, he heard something snap inside the suit, something that felt like men metal teeth dug into his hip. Luca let out a yowl of pain. He pressed his hand to the area, and again he felt something wet and warm run down his leg. That was enough. The suit was dangerous. Luca wanted out of the game. Luca stood and strode, well, hobbled, out of the office. He continued on down the hall to the end, where a bright red exit sign glowed above what looked like an emergency fire door. He grabbed the handle and pushed down. It didn't move. Of course, the door was fake. He'd done it again. He kept forgetting he was inside a game, not a real building. The game, he vaguely remembered, Asher reading, only had one entry or exit point. It was the door beyond the crumbling brick archway, and that door was locked down as soon as the game started. The only real... The only way the real exit door would open was if the game time was up or if all four participants pushed the door together. Oh my gosh, Fazbear Entertainment. I love this. Oh, you, you're... Fazbear Entertainment are the most evil company I've ever heard in any video game ever. <laughs> like, seriously. Seriously, seriously, seriously. This is so funny. Luca tried to remember what Asher had been reading when Luca was concentrating on the scratch on his neck. Right. The game locked up so the participants being chased couldn't cheat and leave the set. All four participants had to agree to halt the game if they wanted out before time was up. Okay, so Luca had to find his friends and tell them he wanted out. But where were they? Luca cocked his head and listened. Manny was an avid talker. He figured he'd be able to hear her chattering somewhere. For several seconds, all Luca heard was silence, but then he heard Maddie's giggle. He shifted to get a sense of where the sound was coming from. Given how muffled the sound was, he figured his friends were still in the ventilation system. He thought about going in after them, through the open duct under the credenza, but they had a strong head start. No, he was better off trying to predict where they'd come out of the ducts. He left the office and started down the hallway. As he walked, he thought about where he should go next. If he were hiding from a stalker, what part of the fake building would he choose? He wouldn't want to come out in a small enclosed space. He'd want room to manoeuvre. He guessed that his friends would head toward the stage or the dining area. Or maybe they'd end up in the party room. Luca headed back to the dining room. He figured from there he'd be able to hear his friends and work out where they were going. Then he could be ready to catch them when they left the vents. Luca tried to pick up his pace so he'd be sure to get in a position before his friends got out of the ductwork, but the quick movement triggered another attack from the suit. Something pierced his stomach, and he doubled over, clutching his gut. That's it, Luca said. He didn't have to leave the game to get out of the suit. All he had to do was take it off. Luca reached up and, and back to try to disconnect the rabbit head from the suit's neck. Asher had said there was a mechanism back there. But Luca couldn't find anything to activate with his clumsy rabbit paws. He pushed, he prodded, nothing. Luca clamped his hands against the side of the rabbit head and tugged on it with all its strength. It was like it had been welded into place. Okay, so maybe he had to leave the head on, but maybe he could open up the suit and tear it free from his body. He needed to get the metal away from his skin. Luca attempted to free the hidden fastenings along the front of the suit. As soon as he fiddled with the first fastening, however, Luca heard a click. Right on the heels of his, right on the heels of the click, he was stabbed in the chest. The solar plexus 
and the lower abdomen. Luke, Luca called out. Sorry, yelled out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Somewhere in the ductwork, Manny screamed. His cry must have startled her. The sounds seemed to be coming from a party room near the arcade. Luca tried to calm himself. He was panting like he'd just run down the hall. He needed to keep it together so he could get to the party room before his friends were out of the ducts. He had to tell them what was going on, because Luca was pretty sure he knew what was going on. And if he was right, he was in trouble. Big, big trouble. Luca started walking again, although walking probably didn't accurately describe the way he was moving. He was more staggering than walking. Pain pulsed in his thigh, his ribs, his hip, and most of his torso. He didn't think the injuries were bad yet, but they'd get worse very quickly if he didn't get out of the suit. Luca's friends might not have believed the mythology of Freddy's, but Luca did, and part of that mythology was that these old suits could be lethal. There was a reason Springtrap was called Springtrap. The original rabbit suit that Afton had supposedly used was a Springlock suit. Springlock suits were multi-use suits. Here comes the law, guys. Um, they could function as either animatronics or as costumes, depending on which mode was chosen. In costume mode, the metal in the suit acted like a collar stay or a corset. It provided a sort of lining for the suit. In animatronic mode, the metal would engage, meaning it would spring inward to provide structure for the animatronic character. The suits were discontinued not long after they were created because the locking mechanisms were often faulty. They could get triggered by the movement of the costume's occupant, and if they were triggered fully, the metal clamps would shoot out and impale the occupant, fatally. Okay, so... <laughs> There's a lot to take in there. They said that the Springlock suits were discontinued shortly after they were they were being used, essentially. And I would say the reason for that could be one of two things. The first thing it could be is the bite of 83. But the second thing it could be is the multiple simultaneous Springlock failures that were mentioned in FNAF 3... Was it FNAF 3 or FNAF 2? I'm assuming it was FNAF 3. Because, yeah, Spring Lock. Um, yeah, th these these details are very cool. Um, the Spring Lock suits weren't continued uh, after, I would say, 1983. I would say Spring Lock suits were only a 1983 thing. Uh, and the only way they've come back is through Golden Freddy and Springtrap. And now here. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Luca was wearing one of the original Springlock suits. He'd suspected it since the f suit first poked at him. He tried to convince himself that he was wrong. He'd just been feeling the ragged edges of a poorly constructed costume, he'd told himself. Surely Fazbear Entertainment wouldn't have put a real Springlock suit in the costume closet. At least that's what he tried to believe. But he'd known. Deep down, he'd always known. And now he couldn't delude himself any longer. He had to face the fact that if he wasn't careful, and if he didn't get out of the suit soon, he might be doing more than role-playing the story of William Afton. Luca's breath sharpened into staccato gasps as he fully realised his predicament. He knew panicking wouldn't help, but the panic was stronger than his ability to reason. He hadn't wanted to be Springtrap. He knew the legends. He knew what the suit meant better than any of his friends. Luca's vision darkened as his mind raced. Get a grip, he commanded himself. You don't have time for this. Luca forced himself to slow his breathing. He needed to move quickly and carefully to intercept his friends. In the suit, Luca couldn't square his shoulders, and he was, in fact, afraid to do so. But he tried to do so mentally, pushing the worries to the back of his mind. He stepped carefully toward the wall and used it for support as he inched toward the party room. He moved as gently as possible, afraid to activate any more of the suit. As he took one step after the other, Luca realised his fear was not actually the was actually not the real reason for the pace of his breathing. The pain wasn't the cause either. What was really getting his heart rate going was his anger. Why had his friends sorry, why had he let his friends talk him into this? At the double doors to the party room, Luca stopped and listened. A muffled scrape and a tap came from the other side of the door. 
Luca slowly pushed the door open and looked into the room. It was shrouded in pools of darkness. The room's only illumination came from a faint spill of light stretching in from the dining room. Luca waited for his eyes to adjust to the murk, and he tried to ignore the thrumming pain in his leg and torso. The party room was similar to the dining room in that it held tables covered in red striped tablecloths. These tables, however, were long banquet style tables instead of smaller four or six seaters. Also like the dining room, this room looked like it had been abandoned mid party. The tables had sorry, the tables held the same half eaten food and drinks, crumpled napkins, and scattered party hats. The party debris here, though, spread beyond the tables. Faded, crinkled streamers littered the floor like a straw. Like straw, sorry. Deflated balloons flopped at the end of strings drooping from the ceiling. Dust-covered wraps, dust-covered wrapped presents were piled near the end of one of the tables. Some open presents lay on empty chairs or were strewn on the floor amid the streamers. But these were freakish menacing versions of mini animatronics, headless dolls, and cracked handheld games spilled out of the gaping boxes. Walking flat-footed, as silently as he could, Luca entered the room and started around one of the three extended tables. A shuffling sound coming from the far side of the room stopped him. When the sound didn't continue, Luca went a few steps further. A clunk and whispers turned him into a statue. If Luca was going to get his friends to understand the crisis, and it was a crisis, he figured he had to wait until they were right in front of him. They wouldn't understand him if he, if he called out. The suit muffled his voice, and between that and his pain, he knew he had to be close for them to understand. A clinking sound and a metallic tink were followed by more whispers. The whispers were louder now. He could hear the conversation. It's stuck, Asher whispered. Well, whack it, Maddie said. I did, Asher said. Move over, Nolan said. This is a man's job, Maddie giggled. Luca figured his friends were intent enough on their conversation that they wouldn't notice any sounds he might make, so he started moving again, panning around the end of the tables to get closer to the back wall of the room. There, he could see that the... Sorry, he could see that the wall held a large grated vent cover. The whispers were coming from behind it. Maddie's giggle, some rustling, and a sharp inhalation led up to a loud bang. The vent cover vibrated, but it didn't come off the wall. You must not be much of a man, Asher said, not bothering to whisper. Shh, Maddie scolded. Be nice. And besides, Luca could be out there. You mean spring trap, Asher corrected. Could you two hush and move over? Nolan asked. I need room to manoeuvre here. Why don't we try another vent cover, Maddie asked. We've tried two already, Nolan said. I'm tired of crawling around in here. Maddie let out a squeak. Sorry, babe. Nolan asked. Uh, Nolan asked. Nolan said. More rustling. A small gasp. Okay there. Nolan said. Um, Luca sidled to the wall next to the vent cover. He put his back to the wall and waited. He heard Nolan grunt, and then the vent cover flew off the wall. It arched a few feet into the room and clattered to the floor. Nolan's feet poked out of the vent opening. My hero, Maddie whispered. Oh, sorry. My hero, Maddie whispered. Why are you whispering? Asher, uh, Asher asked. If Springtrap is out there, it's not like he didn't hear that. Nolan slithered out into the room. Luca considered grabbing Nolan as soon as he was out, but Nolan was the at least likely to pay attention to anything Luca said. Asher and Maddie would be more reasonable. Nolan was also the strongest of the three. He wouldn't hesitate to grapple with Luca and shove Luca around, manhandling his friends was Nolan's idea of being funny. Not only was Luca weakened by pain, he was afraid that fighting Nolan would set off more of the suit's locking system. Luca held his breath. If he remained still, tucked into the wall shadow, Nolan might not notice him until the others were out of the duct. Nolan bent over and stuck a hand inside the duct. He made an exasperated sound and yanked his hand back. Not you, idiot. Ladies first. Sorry, Asher said. More rustling came from inside the vent. Nolan extended his hand again. Oops, Maddie said. Don't look, Asher. This dress is really short. Eyes are closed, Asher said. They better be, Nolan said. Luca gritted his teeth. Nolan pulled Maddie out of the vent. She immediately wrapped her arms around him and gave him a long kiss. A little help here. 
Asher said from inside the vent. Nolan and Maddie ignored him. Asher... <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Asher grumbled and, and began wriggling out of the vent opening without aid. Luca hated watching Nolan kiss Maddie, but this kiss served Luca. Nolan's eyes were closed and Maddie's back was to Luca. They were only a couple feet away. Luca reached out and grabbed Maddie's arm. Maddie, Maddie immediately broke off the kiss. She screamed and tried to wrest herself from Luca's grasp. Luca held on. He started to lean toward her, willing her to listen to what he needed to tell her. But as he did, something inside the rabbit head clicked. Suddenly, metal gripped Luca's skull and his face, piercing through his scalp and the skin between uh, and the skin around his eyes, his nose and his mouth. His entire head was encased in what felt like a serrated vise. It felt like hooked prongs now fastened the rabbit head to Luca. The pain was scorching. It was as if a dozen fiery red pokers were trying to burrow their way into his face and cranium. He screamed. Even though Maddie was still screeching, she managed to yank her arm free as Luca buckled from this new agony. <laughs> Nolan pulled her away from Luca. Asher, now out of the vent and on his feet, grabbed Maddie's other hand. The three turned to run from Luca. Wait! Oh, sorry, wait! <laughs> Luca tried to call out, but the word didn't come out right. It couldn't. Two of the searing metal clasps that had secured themselves to Luca's face curled into his mouth. A third one jabbed through his lips. He could barely move his lips and tongue. Wait came out as... <laughs> it's just a uh, triple A in the book. The unintelligible noise he'd managed to make ended in a gurgle because blood was, trip was filling his mouth. Luca coughed and swallowed the blood. He gagged and tried to speak again. All he could do was make another garbled noise that sounded like a ghostly moan. Nolan, Maddie and Asher were well away from Luca now, thundering around the ends of the tables and heading for the door of the party room. Although they were running, all three were laughing. Maddie's laugh was light and airy. Nolan's was deep and throaty. Asher was chuckling and he turned back to look at Luca as he followed Maddie and Nolan from the room. Way to get into character, Asher called as the three streaked into the dining room, nearly tripping over one another in their delight. Stop, Luca tried to call out. The word came out as a throaty, ah. Uh. Luca's friends laughed harder. He could hear their footsteps slap across the dining room floor. He lurched through the party room, knocking into chairs and ploughing through the streamers which seemed to chitter in amusement as he passed. Everyone and everything was laughing. Everyone except Luca. Luca stumbled out of the party room just as his friends reached the other side of the dining room. They fell against one another in their hilarity as they watched him. Luca started running toward them, but the molten jabs around his head appeared to be affecting his coordination. He tripped over a chair and he reeled into a table. Plates and paper Plates and fake pizza went skidding off of the tablecloth and onto the floor. At the same time, a rapid succession of snapping sounds filled the suit. Luca's arms and legs were speared by dozens of sharp projections that drilled through his skin with such depths that he felt like they were going all the way through him. He howled. Luca's howls stopped his friends in their tracks. They turned to look back at him. All three of them were open-mouthed. As a wide receiver who got regularly tackled, Luca was familiar with pain, but not pain like this. It felt like every nerve ending in his body was firing an agony message to his brain. Luca had been exposed to a lot of depraved waves of harming the human body in the movies he'd seen. He'd watched calmly, all sorts of torture. It had never bothered him. It wasn't real. But this was... Luca had no trouble believing that what he was feeling was like being flayed alive in a medieval torture ta chamber, or maybe it was even worse. Luca took a teetering step toward his friends. He reached toward them and tried to speak again. Help me! The words came out as L-E. And behind the words, more gargling sounds burbled from the back of his throat. He tried to clear it and he made a phlegmy choking sound. Maddie said loudly, That's gross! She grabbed Nolan's hand and pulled him toward a swinging door at the back of the dining room. Asher followed the couple, but in the open doorway he paused to look toward Luca. He grinned. Asher! Luca called out. Asher's name turned into an Ah! 
and even that butchered version of Asher's name disappeared into a moan. The pain in Luca's head was becoming even more excruciating. Asher waved at Luca and disappeared through the swinging door. Luca pushed himself off the table he'd stumbled into. He shoved aside a chair with his foot. Looking at the chair, all Luca wanted to do was sink into it. Actually, he wanted to fall to the floor and just wail. No, what he really wanted was to get out of here, and to do that, he had to reach his friends. He had to try to get them to understand what was happening to him. Luca took a step, groaning at the effort. Then he paused. Maybe he should just stay where he was. Eventually, his friends would have to come back through here to exit the game. Maybe they'd find him and haul him out of wit- and haul him- sorry, what happened? Uh, I, I was flicking through the page. Maybe they'd find him and haul him out with them, thinking he was still playing his role. There was just one little problem with that idea. The spike-like pieces of metal that had embraced Luca's head like a foul, burr-filled helmet had left multiple small stab wounds. Luca could feel the bore holes through his scalp and the skin on his face. He could feel one in the top of each ear. And now, since the suit's last assault, Luca's entire body was being turned into a sieve. Both, sorry, down both arms and both legs, what felt like relentless screwdrivers were drilling through his skin, fascia and muscles. He was being skewered. Every wound on Luca's body bled. He could feel that too. Thick, warm liquid ran along the sides of his face and trickled down his neck. Blood flowed cop copiously over his arms and legs. How much blood he had he already lost? How much was he losing now? He felt lightheaded and woozy. Luca wasn't sure how much longer the game was going to last. What if he passed out before he was over? No, he shouldn't wait where he was. He had to go find his friends. Gathering his strength, Luca managed to get through the dining room, and he made it to the swinging door. When he reached the door, he, f he more fell through it than opened it. He wasn't trying to be quiet about it anyway. Stealth was no longer in his repertoire. The swinging doors led to a huge restaurant kitchen. Stainless steel counters were covered with stacks of pizza boxes. A row of pizza ovens, dark and cold, stood open and empty. Luca floundered into the room and, just, and jolted around the end of a counter, hoping to find his friends crouching behind it. No one was there. Scanning the kitchen, Luca realised that his vision was even more obscured than it had been when he first put on the suit. Blood had pooled in his eyes. He felt like he was looking through a grisly, or grisly red veil. He couldn't rub his eyes to clear them because his absurd mangy... M mangy? Mangy? Mangy. Mangy rabbit paws couldn't reach through the milky orbs of the costume head. Luca blinked several times to try to clear his eyes. On the third blink, he spotted another swinging door. He wobbled in that direction. Once again falling through the door, Luca found himself in the back hallway. Looking toward the dining room, he saw his friends on the either side of the doorway separating the hall from the dining area. They'd stopped, and Asher was meshing, messing with something on the hall. Luca opened his mouth to call out, but before he made a sound, the speakers hissed with static again. Then the spooky voice came through the speakers. There just isn't room in here for both of us. Maddie's giggle drowned out the sound of more static before the speakers once again went silent. That's way too freaky, she said. Asher laughed. Where do you think he is? Maddie asked. Asher stepped away from the hall. Sorry, the wall. He looked down the hallway and he saw Luca. Luca ran as fast as he could. Only about 20 feet separated him from Asher. Crossing that distance quickly shouldn't have been the problem. Luca was known for his speed and agility on the football field. On the football field, however, Luca wasn't hampered by a rabbit suit that was trying to kill him. Now he wasn't able to get up the speed he needed. Instead, he pitched and rolled down at the hall as if he was trying to cross the deck of a ship heaving in a tropical storm. What a great um, simile. As Luca moved, he reached out an arm and he called Ash. Only a nightmarish soft A sound came from his mouth. Even so, Ash didn't turn and run. Instead, he gazed at Luca with wide eyes and a happy smile. Incredible, dude. You're nailing it. Come on, you moron. Nolan yelled at Asher. We're supposed to be trying to get away from him, not admiring his moves. Asher laughed. Sorry. It's just that he's doing such a great job. <laughs> I love how they added that in the story. Let me just take a drink because I've been talking for the last one and a half hours. <laughs> It's actually really difficult. It's actually really difficult making audiobooks. 
especially when you've got to try and do it all in one session. Oh, okay. That's better. A little bit. Um, Asher laughed. Sorry, it's, it's just that he's doing such a great job. Luca vaulted toward Asher, attempting to leap onto his friend. If he had to tackle the clueless guy to get his attention, Luca was okay with that. At this point, Luca wasn't concerned about his movements triggering the suit. The suit was already triggered. The damage was done. Luca's only hope was to get help before the damage was ir irreparable. Asher scurried out of Luca's reach at the last minute. Luca fell into the door jam. He grabbed it. He grabbed at it to stay upright as his friends raced up onto the stage. He's kicking some serious stalker butt, don't you think? Asher said as they ran. Um. Huh. Uh, there's there's a weird glitch going on, I think, where it like skips a little part of the story. So if you're reading from your own book, and there's a little bit after that line that I've missed out, I am so sorry, but my book is not displaying it. It just says Maddie. <laughs> Maddie, full stop. Absolutely. He's like the ultimate monster. Shut up, you two. Nolan snapped. Come on. Maddie huffed. Don't tell me to shut up. Sorry, Nolan said. Asher laughed. Dude, you're in trouble. The sound of his words moved away from Luca as Asher ran. Shut up, Asher, Nolan, uh, Nolan said. His voice came to Luca from an even greater distance. Luca's friends were moving further away, but he could still hear them. Hey, Asher said. He told me to shut up, Maddie. Oh, he's allowed to do that? Uh, sorry, I, can, I said that completely wrong. Oh, he's allowed to do that, Maddie said. She laughed. Asher was about to retort Maddie's words, but Luca couldn't hear them. His friends had gone beyond his hearing range. Their conversation was now a disjointed rumble. Luca sagged back against the wall. His friends thought he was in character, so much so that the worse things got for him, the better they thought he was playing the role. How was he going to convince them that he wasn't playing at anything? How could he let them know he was being deadly serious? This whole thing was supposed to have been a lark. How had it gone so wrong? Luca pushed off the wall. He knew exactly how it had gone wrong. Luca paused, eyeing the console that Asher had tinkered with. It looked like a control panel that operated lights and audio. Luca gazed at the panel longingly. If only he could use it to communicate with his friends. But what good would it do? He couldn't speak. The best he could do was gurgle over the loudspeaker. They'd all think it was part of the act. Besides, his rabbit paws couldn't manage the controls. Luca painstakingly made his way up to the short uh, flight of steps to the stage. He stopped and listened. Manny's voice, high and spirited, fli filtered through the curtains at the back of the stage. Luca clumped by the animatronic sculptures and pushed his way through the folds of the heavy fabric behind them. Past the curtains, Luca found himself in a backstage area stacked with boxes and surrounded by hanging racks holding several Freddy's character costumes. The costumes were similar to the ones in the costume closet, but these were fuzzy with dust and smelled of mildew. <laughs> Are you ready, guys? Are you ready? I don't think it's yet, but um, it, a, a really cool twist or end part of the story is coming up. Um, Luca brushed past them and aimed toward an open doorway. Beyond that doorway, footsteps tapped in rapid succession before Man uh, Mandy? Muddy's giggle faded into the distance. As Luca quickened his pace, his mind, perhaps seeking a break from the pain, took him back into his memories. His childhood fanned out in his head like a deck of playing cards. He saw snippets of his life for an instant before seeing the next and the next. His memory cascade stopped on a camping trip, and he and his friends had taken just before the start of Luca's senior year. The camping trip came so clearly into his thoughts that it activated his senses. He could hear the crackling fire and smell its wood smoke. He could see a clearing in a thick forest of tall fir trees. He could feel the moss beneath where he sat. He could taste the sticky sweat, uh, sweetness of the marshmallow he'd just roasted to perfection. It's about groupthink, son, Luca's dad said in Luca's inner memory movie. They'd been talking about why one of Luca's friends, Remy, had recently been arrested for stealing a car. Luca had known him for a long time, and he'd always been a straight-up dude. Luca always asked why his, uh, his dad why Remy had gotten caught up with a group of guys who thought stealing cars for an impromptu drag race was a good idea. There's something about the dynamics of a group that can override clear thinking, Luca's dad had said, getting into the subject. An individual's inner compass can go wildly askew when he or she is part of a group that gets fired up to go in a direction that any 
that at any other time would feel completely wrong. People in those situations take actions they normally wouldn't take. They listen to others' ideas instead of their own. Groups tend to dampen our inner, inner voice, the one that's telling us what's true for us. What's true for us? The four words echoed uh, around inside Luca's head as his memory movie went dark. The pain came rushing back, and Luca gasped. His breathing was again coming fast and hard. He could barely take a step without moaning. Luca made it through the soft door, and he found himself in a huge storage room. The room was stuffed with stacked boxes. Were they stage dressing, or was the storage area real? Did it matter? Luca stopped to listen. Were his friends in the room? For a few seconds, the only thing Luca could hear was the sound of his own ragged breathing. He forced himself to be still and hold his breath. When he did, he heard nothing. He exhaled. His friends weren't here. Uh, there was no way they could be that quiet. Luca turned to retrace his steps, but his legs gave out. He collapsed to the floor. In the distance, Luca heard what sounded like the distant buzz of an angry bee. He raised his head and strained to listen. A thud followed the buzz, and then Luca heard what sounded like a trill of laughter. His friends were so far away. There was no way to reach them. He was just too weak. Luca dropped his head to the floor. He closed his eyes. Asher let the door to the green-eared killer game fall shut behind him. He started down the hall behind his friends, watching Maddie dance around Nolan. Her eyes were bright, and her smile was wide. That was great, wasn't it? Can you believe how awesome Luca was? Not bad, Nolan agreed. Asher slapped Nolan's back. Not bad? He was stellar. All he had to do was run around a dark, fake restaurant. Luca did all the rest. You're just mad that he was the star and you were a bit player. And you were a, a bit player, kind of like on the field. Nolan turned and shook his fist at Asher. Shut up, Ash. You're not funny. Asher ignored Nolan's threat. He rolled his eyes and waited for the arrogant Hulk to turn back around. Yeah, I kind of am, Asher said when Nolan swung uh, his arm around Maddie. Maddie laughed and glanced at Asher over her shoulder. Yeah, you are. Asher grinned. Then he stopped and looked back at the door to the game. Should we go back in there and get him? He's probably skulking around in that storage room with no idea that the game is over. He'll figure it out eventually, Nolan said. I'm hungry. Let's get change. Then let's go get a pizza. If Luca's not out of there before we get dressed, and he's as smart as you think he is, he'll assume that's where he went and find us there. At the word pizza, Asher stopped caring about Luca's absence. Asher loved pizza, and he was starving. Luca's eyes fluttered open. <laughs> He looked out at soft grey shadows, his mind was mushy, and he felt disembodied, like his conscience was floating around in the ether, somewhere between awake and asleep. Where was he? He started to sit up. Luca returned, abruptly and appallingly, to his body. Stinging pulsations flared from his head to his toes. He fell back. He tried to open his mouth to cry out. His mouth wouldn't open. Everything came back to him. Luca remembered this situation. He was stuck inside a springlock suit and it was killing him. How long had Luca been lying here? Where were his friends? Were they still playing the game? Were they hiding someplace, waiting for him to come and stalk them? Wherever they were, they probably weren't going to come back into this room again. Luca had to move. Groaning, Luca tried to push off the floor, but he couldn't do it. It felt like his muscles had turned to mincemeat. In a way, he supposed they had. Luca figured the spike-like mechanisms of the suit had dug deep into his muscles, probably very nearly shredding them. Luca ground his teeth together and commanded himself to rise above the pain and go in, uh, go on in in spite of it. Um, he knew how to do that. He did it on the football field all the time. Luca called on the same determination now. He told his nerve endings to shut up and he pressed himself onto his hands and knees. His current situation was his own second and eight at the goal. If he gave up now, he'd lose and he wouldn't just lose this asinine game. He understood how dire his situation was. If he didn't make his way back to the entrance of his set, he was going to lose his life. Luca managed to push up onto one knee. From there, gasping at the explosions of misery all over his body, he staggered to his feet. The second he was upright, Luca, was, Luca more fully processed the severity of his situation. 
Inside his tennis shoes, his feet were drenched in blood. He could even hear his socks squish when he moved his feet. Luca tried to look down to see the outside of his suit. Was it saturated with blood? It was probably a blessing that the rabbit head didn't let him bend his neck far enough to see his legs. He raised an arm, but the lighting was too dim for him to differentiate between blood and the suit's already stained and dark and dirty green fur. Luca didn't need to see the outside of the suit to know he'd lost way too much blood. Who was he kidding? That wasn't news. He'd known he was starting to bleed out when the suit had locked down on him in the dining room. He'd just been trying to avoid accepting the truth. The minute Luca had seen the awful Springtrap suit, he'd known that putting it on was wrong. Nothing about the idea of wearing the suit and pretending to be a murderer felt okay to him. Luca didn't even want to pretend to be a bad guy. He was Luca, a good guy who liked to do the right thing. Today, he hadn't done the right thing, and he was paying for it. Giving himself no more time to stop and process his suffering, Luca got moving. He lurched through the storage room and made his way to the backstage area. Once again, Luca passed the rows of the old costumes. As he went by, a couple of them swayed on the hanging rod. Luca's steps faltered. Had he brushed against the costumes? Why had they moved? Luca frowned. Why did he have the sudden, re uh, sudden sensation that he wasn't alone back here? And why did he think that whoever was in here with him was not one of his friends? Staying as still as, as his wavering legs would let him, Luca listened hard. Unfortunately, Luca's rough breathing couldn't be quieted. All he could hear was his own laboured inhales and exhales. But wait, there, just for an instant. Had he heard the hint of movement? Just a second or two of the sound of fabric rubbing against fabric? Before Luca could answer that question, a door slammed in the distance. The sound of small um, galloping feet followed the bang. In the dining room, out in front of the stage, little kids' voices chattered. Luca moved forward again. Parting the curtains at the back of the stage, Luca stepped up behind the frozen Freddy standing at the microphone. Looking past Bonnie's immobile guitar, Luca gazed out at the dining area. Just inside the entrance to the dining room, three small children huddled together, their eyes opened wide, their faces tense with a combination of anxiety and excitement. The kids gaped at what lay before them. As quickly as he could, um, stifling a whimper, Luca ducked behind the leading stage curtain. There was no way he wanted these little kids to see him. Not only was he wearing the horrendous suit, his inability to walk normally or speak at all would terrify the kids, maybe even scar them for life. The last thing they needed to see was a twitching, bleeding version of the already horrifying spring trap. Luca figured he'd wait until the kids went someplace to hide before he made um, his way to the game's exit and pounded on it until someone came to let him out, or until he died, whichever came first. The kids looked to be maybe seven or eight, Luca thought. Two were girls. One was a boy. All three children were in costumes, similar to the ones Maddie, Asher and Nolan had donned for the game. Luca was barely lucid. He knew that. He was moving more on autopilot than he was taking conscious action. Some primitive part of his mind was trying to save him. He was pretty sure his adrenaline-driven fight-or-flight mechanism was the only thing that gave his legs the strength to hold him up and propel him forward. But when Luca saw the kids... His reasoning mind managed to come back online. They couldn't be here if this game was still going. The game must have ended for this group. That meant Maddie, Asher and Nolan had left. Why had they left him in here? He tried to tackle that question, but it was beyond his mind's current capacity. Besides, it didn't matter. What mattered was that Luca had to find a way out of the game. This place is creepy, one of the little girls said. The girl had a cute round face and long blonde hair. She was one of the. F uh, she was the one in the flowered dress. Duh, Valerie. The boy said. He wore a costume similar to Nolan's. It's supposed to be creepy. The other girl, who had black hair that reminded Luca of Maddie's, punched the boy. Don't be mean. In spite of his plight, if Luca could have moved his mouth, um, he would have smiled. This girl was like a little clone of Maddie. So, where should we go? Valerie asked. If we stand here, he'll find us. The boy pointed down the main hall. Let's go that way. As the kids scampered out of the dining room, Luca started to step out from behind a curtain. He stopped when he heard a scurrying sound behind him. Luca turned. The pain of his quick rotation filled Luca's eyes with tears. 
He felt their saltiness sting the gouges on his face as they dripped down his cheeks. He couldn't even brush the tears away. All he could do was grit his teeth and ignore the additional layer of torment. A tap and a small thump came from backstage. There was someone back there. Luca tried to get to the stage's rear curtain as fast as he could. He was so unsteady though, he zigzagged him instead of going in a straight line. It took several seconds to get to the rear of the stage. There, Luca hesitated. Why was he wasting his time checking out the sounds? It was probably just another kid, one in a spring trap costume. Luca needed to stick with his original plan. He needed to get to the game's exit. Luca's head swiveled toward the exit, but he didn't take a step. Something was holding him in place. Was it some kind of mental confusion caused by the blood loss? Or was it something else? Something real? Maybe it was instinct. Something, besides his own pain, was putting Le Luca on edge. Well, whatever it was, he had to find it. Luca put a hand out and carefully pushed back the edge of the backstage curtain. He ducked his rabbit head around the thick fabric and surveyed the space filled with boxes and costumes. Luca saw what he'd been unconsciously perceiving. The thing that had drawn him back here was... Earl. <laughs> Standing with his back to Luca, Earl's unmistakable shorn head was about to be concealed inside a cheap Halloween costume-like spring trap rabbit head. The rest of Earl was already covered by an equally cheap-looking Halloween costume-like rabbit onesie. Both the head and the body of Earl's suit were designed to look like the one Luca was wearing. Earl's suit, however, was obviously just a costume. It wasn't a real Springlock suit, like the one killing Luca. But cheap suit or not, Earl was turning himself into Springtrap. He was dressing up as a killer. Was it going to be an act, or was it for real? Earl pulled the Springtrap costume head into place. He started to turn around. Luca jerked his own head back behind the curtain. What should he do now? If Luca hadn't been dying, and he knew he was dying, the idea of getting out the game was something he was just telling himself so he didn't lie down and give up. He would have rushed backstage and tackled the pervert in the rabbit suit. But could he rush fast enough to get the guy before he ran? Luca had to try. Gathering his strength, Luca yanked behind the curtain. He charged. Luca came to an abrupt stop. Earl was gone. Luca rushed forward and nearly fell to his knees from the exertion. He stopped and clutched a costume rack. He looked around. Where had the creep gone? There was no way Earl could have gone past Luca, so Earl must have gone into the storage room. Luca took a deep breath and went in that direction. Every step a struggle, every motion torture, Luca searched for Earl in the storage room. After checking just behind a couple stacks of boxes, Luca was sure Earl wasn't in the room. Luca was making so much noise, he couldn't contain his moans and laboured breathing, that Earl could easily have slipped away when he heard Luca coming. But where did Earl go? While Luca wavered in the doorway, trying to focus enough to figure out what to do next, footsteps pattered across the stage. Amy, look! This is so cool! Luca recognised the voice. It was the little boy from the entrance to the dining room. The kids were back. Shh, Adam! A little girl whispered. This was the Maddie clone. So her name was Amy. Do you want him to find us? How do you even know if he's in here? Valu asked. We haven't seen him yet. He's in here, Amy said. Luca moved as quietly as he could past the costumes to get closer to the stage so he could hear the kids. Unfortunately, he was moving so clumsily, he couldn't be quiet. He lost his balance and his foot came down hard on the floor. He froze at the sound of the thud. Valerie squealed. Do you hear that? Shh, a Amy whispered. He's back there, Amy whispered. What are we going to do? Valerie asked. We're going to split up and all go in different directions, Amy said. I don't want to be by myself. Valerie protested loudly. Shh, Amy sighed loudly. Fine, you go with Adam. Go hide in one of those rooms in the main hall. I'll head toward the kitchen. He can't get us all at once if we're not together. If he can't get us all, we'll win. But, Valerie began, just go, Amy commanded. Come on, Adam whispered. A few seconds passed, then Valerie whispered, don't get caught, Amy. Luca heard scampering footsteps. He heard Amy take a deep breath. Luca moved as fast as he could out onto the stage. He got there just as Amy pushed through the swinging doors into the kitchen. And as soon as the doors stopped swinging, Earl raised up in front of the stage. He'd been crouching near the far stage steps. Luca gasped as Earl trotted toward the swinging doors. How had Earl gotten from the storage area to the dining room without passing Luca? Blinking to try to clear his vision, Luca uh, tottered down the steps. As soon as he was down them, 
He saw how Earl had made it to the dining room without being seen. The vent cover near the base of the stage was hanging open. He'd used the duct work. Luca turned toward Earl, but Earl was gone again. Luca started to rush toward the swinging doors. Had he blacked out for a second and lost time? Had Earl already gone into the kitchen? A metallic rasp gasped, uh, grabbed Luca's attention. He looked toward the sound. Earl was crawling into another vent opening near the swinging door. Luca guessed that Earl was going to use the ductwork to sneak up on Amy and grab her. Then he was probably going to drag the girl back into the ducts. No one would find them. Luca had to stop him. Queasy and nearly out of his mind with pain, Luca felt the room spin as he attempted to run toward the swinging door. He tried to keep his balance, but his legs buckled under him. He went down. Fortunately, Luca more slumped um, to the floor than dropped. He made no sound as he sprawled next to the vent opening Earl had disappeared into. For a second, Luca lay still. This was the end. He didn't think he could move again. From beyond the swinging doors, Amy screamed. A patter of footsteps followed the scream. Heavier footsteps followed the patter. Something crashed to the floor. A door thudded. The sound of the footsteps began to recede. Amy started to scream again, but the scream was immediately muffled. He was her, Luca thought. What? <laughs> um, Luca was pretty sure Amy had run out of the kitchen and out into the hall. Um, Earl had caught up with her quickly. He'd probably dragged her into one of the maintenance closets. Luca pushed up onto his elbows. No way was he going to let that outsider hurt Amy. No way. Luca bawled in agony as he forced himself to his feet. The sound, though, like every sound he made, was muffled and distorted. He was sure Earl wouldn't have heard him. Taking a deep breath, refusing to make another sound or even consider the new gush of blood rushing from his thigh, Luca lurched into the hallway. Something hit the door of the maintenance closet just down from the swinging doors to the kitchen. Amy shrieked. Luca threw himself forward, willing himself to stay upright. His legs felt as rubbery as the fake knife he'd wielded earlier. His knees buckled twice. Both times he steeled himself and straightened them again. He could do this. He could get to Amy before Earl hurt her. Amy's screams turned into yowls. Several bangs vibrated the maintenance closet door. It was obvious Amy was thrashing to break free of Earl's grasp. Let me go! Amy screamed. Luca summoned his, wheel, his will and took another step. <laughs> Luca summoned his will. I love that line. <laughs> um, calling on the dwindling reserves he had left. Luca propelled himself forward as fast as he could. He reached the door, deliberately ignoring the spikes boring into his knuckles and wrists as he moved. Luca grabbed the door handle and wrenched, um, and wrenched the door open. He thrust himself into the maintenance closet. The first thing Luca saw when he practically fell into the cramped space stuffed with brooms, mops and buckets was Amy. Writhing like an enraged squid, Amy churned her arms and legs in a blur of determination. Her eyes squeezed shut in either terror or concentration or both. Amy flailed and fought with everything she had. No matter what she did though, Earl hung on to her until he turned and his rabbit head came up. Then Earl's pale eyes, peering through the holes in the rabbit costume head, focused on Luca and they blinked in confusion. The confusion was just enough to distract Earl. He loosened his grip on Amy enough that she was able to lean forward and bite down hard on Earl's forearm. Amy must have had a powerful set of teeth because her bite made it all the way through the fur of Earl's springtrap suit. Earl squawked and dropped her. Amy fell on her butt a few feet from Earl. <clears throat> Amy cried out when she hit the floor, but she popped back to her feet immediately. Her eyes glazed as if she couldn't even process her surroundings. She darted out of the maintenance closet and pounded down the dining room. That's it, Luca thought. Run, Amy. Earl bellowed in frustration and anger, and he started to take off after Amy. Luca, however, wasn't going to let Earl get out of the closet. Luca jerked himself forward, intending to tackle the man. Instead of tackling Earl, though, Luca fell into him. But that worked too. Luca's off-balance dive took him and Earl to the floor. Although Earl tried to throw Luca off, Luca didn't give Earl the chance to gain purchase. Instead, Luca bent around Earl and wrapped him in a Nelson hold. Earl scrabbled to get free, but even though Luca was dying, his waning strength and the suit's heavy metal was greater than what Earl's skinny frame could muster. Luca had Earl pinned, so he used his advantage. 
Luca wrapped his ruined r rabbit paws around Earl's neck and squeezed as hard as he could. Earl tried to buck free of Luca's strange hold, but Luca's hands were locked into place. It was as if his hands had merged with the metal in the suit. They hooked into Earl's neck and tightened inexorab inexorably until Earl's airway was permanently blocked. Earl's body thrashed against the floor and kicked out at the brooms and mops for what seemed like a lifetime. During that lifetime, Luca's memories spooled out in his mind for one last review. Trailing the scenes from his past, Luca hopes for the future uh, unfurled in his inner vision. These hopes wouldn't be fulfilled. He wasn't going to achieve anything he'd been sure he'd do. Finally, Earl went still. As soon as Earl stopped moving, Luca let himself give in to the inevitable. His body, except his hands, or everything except his hands, which seemed to be fused to Earl's neck, went limp. The last thought Luca had, before thoughts were beyond him, was that his inner compass was working again. His final act had not been someone else's idea. It had been his own. <laughs> okay. First of all, that ending sentence or ending paragraph, chilling, amazing, beautiful writing. I love it so much. I have so much to say about this story. And honestly, if you want to hear about the story, then go follow the Dark Rooms podcast, which is something that I'm part of. We're going to be covering the stories in some of the phobia soon. We're going to be chatting about them. It's going to be a good time. But right now, all I can say, this story mind is mind blowing. It's 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 genuinely just so good, and not just because it's Springtrap and it's the Faz Bear's fright and stuff like that. It's genuinely just amazing in how it's structured, in how it's written, in how everything comes together nicely. Uh, and obviously, I love the sneak peek at the start that Earl was there. Um, and how he came back at the end and he was, you know, the actual, like, killer or whatever. And, uh, yeah, guys, I have one funny detail that you may not have picked up on. Earl's name. There's something sus about Earl's name. What? What is it? Fun fact, Earl's name is an anagram for real. What do I think that means? Well, I think that Earl is the person that owned the Springtrap costume that, um, that Luca had on. Um, and if so, that's where the real part comes in. Like, it, it's the real costume. Uh, and... What Luca was supposed to wear was the costume that Earl was wearing. So it was all a massive mix-up. And that, to me, is so interesting. So intriguing that Earl has a spring locks, a spring trap suit. Like, that's, that's, that's really weird, right? And here's, here's, like, one thing I'm thinking is, like, where did he get this from? Okay? Because this story is canon to the, um the main pizza plex in this series, uh, which is the one that also has under construction and haps, uh, and also the VR booth and like future stories that are gonna come up. Um, but the thing is, um, Earl, how did Earl get this? Like, like if, if this pizza plex is the truth pizza plex from Security Breach, which I personally think it is, where did Earl get the spring trap suit? I think it could be, it could be the spring trap suit that uh, that Afton had on. He basically took it off and went into the scrap trap suit. And then somehow Earl got a hold of the spring trap suit. I don't know if that's a good theory or not. Or it could be, it, it could just be, um, you know... The multiple simultaneous spring lock failures, like there could have been a spring trap suit before spring trap ever existed. You know that, like that's interesting to me. Anyway, um, my throat is so sore. I've been speaking nonstop for two hours, so I'm gonna have to end it here. But again, follow the Dark Queens podcast. I hope you enjoyed. Subscribe, um, for more. Uh, Cleithrophobia could be the, like. Okay, just the prologue of Cleithrophobia could be the craziest thing we've ever had in these books. Like, it does something that I've never seen in these books before, and it is crazy good. So, um, I'm super excited for that tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.